Our version of Hello World in embedded system design is to light an LED. The next step is to read a switch. So our task today, simply connect a switch to one of the inputs on the GPIO header of the Raspberry Pi. Now a switch circuit is not that complicated. What you've got is some sort of a source voltage going through what we call a pull-up resistor, typically 10K ohms. And then we've got our switch itself that connects or disconnects, makes or breaks a circuit. And then on the other end of that, we've got ground or zero volts, right? Our reference voltage. Now, what we're looking at is actually the voltage level that is at this pin right here. In fact, sometimes we will also put a resistor there in order to protect the circuitry of our device, the, the input circuitry on our Raspberry Pi's processor, for example. Now, what happens is, is that when this switch is open and we've got a voltage divider going between our, our source voltage and our ground, our, our zero volts, well, what we have is, for all intents and purposes, infinity ohms when the switch is open, which means that because infinity is a lot larger than 10K ohms, the entire voltage drop from VCC down to zero volts is going to be had across that switch. So when the switch is open, we've got VCC at this point, okay? Now, if we close the switch, and when we close the switch, what we're doing is basically making it so it's zero ohms. And now our voltage divider says, okay, the entire amount of voltage is now going to be dropped across this 10K ohms, and this zero volts is connected directly to that point there. So closed, we have zero volts or ground. What do we need to do in order to connect this to the processor? Well, what we've got in the Raspberry Pi is actually a set of internal pull up and pull down resistors. I'm focusing just on pull up resistors. This guy right here is referred to as a pull up resistor. So what we've got internal to the Raspberry Pi is this circuitry. So I can actually I can actually turn on and off or connect or disconnect this pull-up resistor. We're going to find out how to do that whenever we actually do the lab. Now there are a couple other things that we need to worry about when it comes to connecting a switch or reading a switch from the processor. One of the things is bouncing. Now Bouncing, what exactly does that mean? You would think that whenever you have a mechanical switch connected to the input of a microprocessor, that it's a very clean on and off signal. Whenever your finger is off the button, you have a logic one there, a high voltage, right? And that high voltage turns to a logic zero instantly as soon as you push the button. Just this nice sharp down, this it's called a falling edge, down to zero. And then when you release the button, then that zero, logic zero, gets that nice sharp edge going up to a logic one. Now it turns out that's not quite the way it works. The switch has this bouncing. And so what happens is, is you've got a logic one while it's released, and then when you push the button, the mechanical connections actually make and break and kind of do this little sloppy up and down for a little while until they stabilize at the logic zero. And so we've got the switches open, we're in the process of pushing the switch down, and then we get a nice stable logic zero. The same, tur it turns out, happens when you take your finger off the button. When you take your finger off the button, you're going to get this kind of jagged start going back up to the logic one to the released condition. Now these periods of time don't last that long. In fact, you're looking at possibly, oh I don't know, about... 20 milliseconds. So it's not a long period of time, but it's long enough whenever the processor is reading this input just as fast as can be, it's long enough to register as multiple button presses.
Now, what we are going to do is use something called an interrupt service routine. Specifically, what we're going to do is a hardware interrupt that is watching for a change from a logic 1 to a logic 0 on an input pin. And this downward transition, this falling edge, is what is going to cause an interrupt service routine, a function, to be called. So it'll be an event. And this event is looking for this 0 to 1 transition. Turns out, because of bouncing, and in the case of this diagram, we're getting 1, 2, 3, 4 falling edges. And we're going to get all four of those calls to this interrupt service routine. So as far as the interrupt service routine is concerned, it is just going to be called multiple times. That's not the only problem though. When you take your finger off the button, notice also that we're getting one, two, three, also falling edges as that button is bouncing. We would then think, oh, the button is getting pushed again. No, it was getting released. And so how do we avoid this? Now, there are a number of ways to avoid this. One of the things that I would like to, to point out is that the switches I'm going to use are not very high quality. I got this little five position joystick switch. It's actually got seven buttons on this device. And so I can push up, down, left, right, and also depress the button. And that's five different switches that are going to register as connections on this little header here. There are also two buttons, a set and reset, that are also going to short two pins on this, on this device. Um, this is not really a high quality device. It cost me just a couple of bucks for the circuit board and the switch and so forth. So this is going to be a pretty bouncy connection. Higher quality buttons are going to give you a little bit better on off, but they're still going to bounce. So we still need to handle this bouncing. Now, one of the things that we can do in terms of hardware to make our hardware perform better is if you put a capacitor across the switch and this protection resistor, you've got what's called an RC circuit. And remember, the way what happens is, is if I've got a capacitor that's fully discharged, that when you close the switch in order to start charging that capacitor, what you're going to get is a, a, a ramping up. Instead of it being instantly on and instantly off, these immediate changes there, it's going to ramp. And so what's going to happen with our circuit here, with our bouncing, is it's not going to be on long enough for that capacitor to, uh, to charge. And then whenever you get the bouncing down, it's going to not be on lo off long enough for it to uh, to, well, it's going to be off for a while and it's going to discharge that capacitor. But the key is, is that these on periods are not on long enough for it to fully charge up. And then whenever it does stabilize, then what we're going to get is this, this curve that's going to ramp up to the voltage that represents a logic one. Now, this works because what will happen is that the rising edge is not going to be detected here. Also, we can have a similar thing going on with the falling edge, right? And then it'll go like that. And so this will smooth it out so that the processor will only detect one transition from a logic 1 to a logic 0 and only one transition from a logic 0 to a logic 1. There is a problem, though. And that problem is that we are getting from the time that the button is pressed to the time that it is detected by the processor, there is a delay. This is okay if it's just simply a human being pressing a button. But what if, it, you know, for maybe to turn on an LED or something like that. But what if you need an instantaneous, within microseconds response between the time that an event happens and the time that the micro microprocessor responds? It may be that this delay is not acceptable. And if that's the case, we need to go with an alternative to this uh, RC type circuit. Now, another way of handling this, another way of doing this, is with something called a software delay.
Now, the way a software delay works is that, yes, we come into our, we come into our interrupt service routine, we detect the button press right as soon as it happens. But, and, and then we handle it, okay? So, for example, whatever reaction you need to have based on when that button is pressed, we handle it at that moment. But then, in software, we impose a delay before we go back to what we were doing, before we start processing or watching for anything else to happen. Now, the software delay makes it so that, and once again, it only needs to be about 20 milliseconds. That software delay will allow all those little bumps to pass. The problem is, is that any time you impose a delay on your script or your program, what you're doing is you're locking up your program and keeping it from doing anything else that it could be doing. So there's actually a better way to do this. Um, in some of my other lessons, you may have uh, heard me talking about this thing called a timer or some timers. And these are hardware devices inside of the processor that their whole purpose is to just simply count every time the system clock or some other clock increments. And so as you get these clock pulses, it's just counting. And so what we do is every time, and what we, and I probably need to make some more room up here, but what we'll do, we'll make the bouncing over here, okay? So what we do is we enter the interrupt service routine here, right? And we enter the interrupt service routine again here, and we enter the interrupt service routine here. Now, what we do is we read the timer at each one of these positions. So every time we jump into an interrupt service routine, we read a timer. And we take a look at the difference between the last time we entered this and the next time, and this, and this time. So you're just, you're measuring the period of time between these interrupt service routine calls. If that period of time is less than 20 milliseconds, you know that this is probably switch bouncing and you need to ignore it, jump over the code that you were supposed to execute when you received a falling edge and, then, and, and, and just go back to your main code and wait for another, another interrupt. And if another one in, it call, is called and you have recorded the period of time that you've recorded the timer value from the last time and compared it to the timer value for this time, once again, if it's less than 20 milliseconds, you don't do anything, you just simply assume it's switch bounce, okay? Let's talk about the actual connections whenever it comes to our Raspberry Pi and our switches. Now remember I talked about those pull-up resistors, those resistors that allow us when the switch is open to pull our inputs up to a logic one. Well, it turns out that the Raspberry Pi has the ability to set pull-up resistors and for a slightly different type of circuit, also use pull-down resistors. Now, whenever you first power up the Raspberry Pi, all of those GPIO inputs are typically defaulted to inputs. There's a good reason for that. And the reason is, is that if you have some pin that comes up in default mode and is set as an output, and there is an, a circuit like a switch that's driving it as an input, if those are at different levels, you're going to damage the processor. You're going to damage that input on the Raspberry Pi. Now, I'll, if you take a look at this output, this output is from a library of routines called, or it's the command line interface, for a library of routines called Wiring Pi. And Wiring Pi gives you the ability to make this display and show you what all the different values are for our different inputs. And you'll notice that except for a couple of ones, the ones that are on physical pins 8 and 10, all of them are defaulted to inputs. What is, and, and you can see that under the mode column. So the physical pins are that center column, and then you've got the, the mode, which is on either side of the V columns. Now the V, those are showing what the default values are. Now this particular Raspberry Pi, whenever I powered it up, 
I went ahead and just did a GPIO read all, and that gave me this table. And what I'm looking at is that some of them have values, that's the current value being read, of one. So for example, pin, uh, whenever you're looking at physical pins three, five, and seven, these are on the Broadcom GPIO representation, pins two, three, and four, GPIO two, GPIO three, and GPIO four. Look at their values, those are ones. Those have been defaulted as inputs with a pull-up resistor turned on, with enabled. But then look at the bottom corner of the table. In the bottom corner of the table with physical pins 36, 38, and 40, those GPIO pins 16, 20, and 21, those, val those values are zero. Those are ones where the pull-down resistor has been enabled. In our software, we're gonna show you how to set those to pull up resistors so that our switches, our switch circuits can have that connection to ground, all right? So let's take a look at what the connections are gonna look like on the Raspberry Pi. Now, if you look at your Raspberry Pi from the top, you can see on this one corner of the, of the processor, you've got this 40 pin header on the Raspberry Pi. Well, we're playing around with the 3B plus or the four right now. And so what you've got are 40 pins, and I'm not gonna draw all 40 pins, but I'm gonna draw the bottom couple. And at this top, this top left-hand corner, this guy is pin one, all right? And it's numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so forth. Now, when we come down to this bottom here, this pin right here is pin 40. And in the interest of keeping our wiring neat, what I'm gonna do is use these outside pins right here uh, in order to connect to the Raspberry Pi. And I'm going to try and identify these. So I, well, I already said that this one's pin 40. So that guy right there is pin 38. This one right there is 36. And then we have 34. And then we have 32. All right. Now, if you go back to that GPIO read all, what you'll see is that this pin right here is actually connected to what we call GPIO, and that is not enough room. So that's GPIO 12. And then the 30, pin 34, this is ground or zero volts. This is what's being connected to the other side of our switch. And then we've got GPIO 16, and then GPIO, and that one's 20. And then pin 40 down here, that one is connected to GPIO 21. Now these numbers are going to be important whenever we go to the software, when we start writing the script. But what we're going to do is make a very simple connection. And if we've got our, our um, switchboard here, the, 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 this, this little board right here, what you'll see is that the pins on the top, it's got eight pins. So there's one, two, three, four, one. All right, eight pins. And these guys are labeled COM, and COM is really going to be, it's a common, which means that all of the switches have, at their one end, they're tied to this common. On the other end of the switch, well, those guys are output to these different pins here. So you've got up, down, you've got uh, left, I think right, I think is spelled R-H-T, and then you've got uh, mid, and that's what happens when you push down on the button. So, so we've got, we've, if we're holding our pin here, we go up, and then we go down, and then we go left, and then we go right, and then pushing the button is mid. And then there are these two buttons down here, which are set and RST. We are only going to be using these top five connections, com, up, down, left, and right, in order to read the positions on this switch. Now, common, what we're gonna do is we are going to connect that to our ground. So pin 34. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect up to GPIO 12, pin 32. I'm gonna connect down to GPIO 16, pin 36. I'm gonna connect left 
to GPIO 20, pin 38, and I'm going to connect right to GPIO 21, pin 40. And in doing so, we should be able to do a, a, basically a simple joystick application where we can detect whenever, whatever position I've moved, up, down, left, right, okay? So, next what we're gonna do is we're gonna move to the Raspberry Pi, we're gonna do the actual connections, and then after that, we're gonna write our script.